If you were here last week and you remember, we began discussing, about, we began talking about foundations, the foundations on which we build our lives. And we looked at that familiar passage from Matthew chapter 7, dealing with the wise man and the foolish man. And we talked about how their foundations determined each of their futures. But it was the catalyst of the storm that revealed to us who was wise and who was foolish. It was the storm that showed them for who they really were. And so following that up, we're going to talk for a little while about storms today. And our text comes from Mark chapter 4. Beginning in verse 35, we read, That day when evening came, he said to his disciples, Let us go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along just as he was in the boat. There were also other boats with him. A furious squall came up, and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? He got up, rebuked the wind, and said to the waves, Quiet, be still. Then the wind died down, and it was completely calm. He said to his disciples, Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? They were terrified and asked each other, Who is this that even the wind and the waves obey Him. Let's pray quickly as we begin this morning. Lord, would You bless these few moments we have to read and understand in a greater way how this passage reveals Your nature and Your kingdom and how we can use it in our lives to bring You greater glory. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, Tuesday is the first of a five-month stretch of days that we around here know as hurricane season. Uh, when I interviewed here in November of 2005, I had done my research on hurricanes. Just one summer before, in 2004, y'all had hurricanes Charlie, Francis, Ivan, and Jean. It was the first time four tropical storms produced hurricane-force winds in one state in one season since 1886. And I told somebody, I think I told a few people before I came, I said, you got to be crazy to move to Southwest Florida. You know, like, that's never going to happen. And as a man plans his course, you know what I mean, uh, we went 12 years after I moved here without sniffing a hurricane before Irma. And as far as I'm concerned, may it be so for the next 12 also. But for the next five months, we will analyze and overanalyze every storm in the Atlantic and the Gulf because God knows we all need a reason to panic buy gasoline, right? Uh, my wife sent me this picture uh, a few weeks ago during our latest fear of gasoline Armageddon. I was half afraid to use this picture because I was afraid it was going to be somebody in this room. Uh, <laughs> When the government is issuing warnings not to put gasoline in plastic bags, uh, you've either lost it, or maybe we ought to be considering putting gasoline in plastic bags, if that's what the government is advising. I'm not sure what we should be doing. The, these people remind me of a term that I've come uh, to, to that I've become familiar with lately. It's the term prepper. You ever heard of a prepper? Like when I was in high school, we talked about preppy people. It's not preppy. It's prepper. A prepper is somebody... Who's, who's taken extreme measures and planning for catastrophe or disaster, specifically as it relates to the end of the world. Uh, in, in some ways, they're similar to survivalists, right? Um, this is an area nearly the size of Manhattan that lies in South Dakota's Black Hills. It is called Vivos X Point and is the largest survivalist community in the world. Each one of the mounds that you see is an underground bunker, uh, an apocalypse shelter, they call it, designed to withstand 500,000 pound internal blasts. This specific location in South Dakota 
is at least 100 miles away from the nearest known military nuclear targets. And in the wake of the coronavirus pandemic, Vivo said that demand for its bunkers has grown exponentially. Uh, inquiries about their bunkers have increased by over 1,000%. Sales have increased by 400%. And the company refers to its underground hideouts as a backup plan for mankind. <laughs> Okay, I can't. These people are prepared for any storm that may come along, except perhaps an earthquake. But everything else, they got it covered, right? Uh, well, the storms that we are discussing today aren't necessarily the Armageddon type, but they might feel that way when they hit us. And everybody's got them. We talked about it last week. Some of them are predictable, but most of them are not. And there are people in this room right now who are probably enduring storms that we may or may not know anything about. Behind the handshakes and the smiles and the greetings and the well wishes are people who can't see a horizon or a shore. The clouds are that thick. Or maybe you're a person for whom life is all sunny right now. I, ho I hope it is for you. If that's you, live it up. Bask in it. Enjoy it. It was kind of that way for the apostles on the day that we're reading about in Mark chapter 4. Jesus has been teaching by the sea for, for the entire day. And as evening approaches, he says to his disciples, let us go over to the other side. I want to begin this section by noting that the apostles are going to do exactly what Jesus says. Uh, they are going to do exactly what he tells them and go exactly as he tells them to go to the place where he intends for them to reach. And leaving the crowd behind, they took him along just as he was in the boat. There were also other boats with him. A furious squall came up and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Not only are they doing exactly what Jesus says, heading for the destination Jesus has in mind, but he's with them. He's in their boat. There are other boats, but Jesus is in the boat that the disciples are in. And while obeying Jesus, while right in the middle of God's will, there arises a storm. It comes out of nowhere while they are obeying him, while they are doing exactly what he said, which ought to be instructive for us to remember that it still storms in the middle of God's will. Just because you're on the right path, just because you're faithful, just because you're pursuing God's glory with all you do, it's still going to storm from time to time. In fact, I'm convinced that God has no greater method of increasing our faith and revealing His nature than through the storms of life. It's His best strategy, I believe. There are storms in my life that have come about suddenly with no warning. There are storms in my life that I have brought up my, on myself. But I needed them all. And I know there are more to come. And I hope I'll have the foresight when they come to look on them with proper perspective instead of giving in to the unshaky foundation of heart and mind and emotion. And just as they are unsettling in my life, they are unsettling for the apostles as well. This storm will be the source of significant unsettling. I mean, naturally, it will unsettle the seas. There's nothing they can control about this storm. Can't control the wind, can't control the waves, can't control the rain. There's nothing they can control. And because they can't control it, what will happen with them is what tends to happen with you and I when we experience something suddenly that we can't control, their, their emotions begin to get involved. Their emotions begin to get heightened. Things begin to get emotionally out of control. We know this because in verse 40, Jesus will ask them, why are you afraid? And they're probably thinking, well, we're afraid because we're all about to die. But that's why they're afraid, because their emotions have overwhelmed them. Where things were fine just hours ago, they are now experiencing anxiety and fear and panic and an inability to control this unexpected storm. And now, because your, height, your heightened emotions have gotten the best of you, 
it begins to affect your belief. It will unsettle their beliefs. And this is often how the storms of life work. The unexpected occurs. Sudden financial troubles, an ominous medical report, something happens in your marriage, your child is enduring something difficult, there's drama at work, maybe there's no work. But the storm comes and we get emotional about it. And when we get emotional about it, our minds start to move to worst case scenarios. And when our minds start to move to worst case scenarios, we start to forget what we know or what we've believed. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. In the middle of this storm, my man is asleep. Now, I have a hard time believing this. Uh, you know, I, I, lay in my, I lay in my bed in my bedroom when it's storming outside, and that's great. I, I rather enjoy that. But in a boat where water is crashing over the walls, filling the boat, and Jesus, I, I just sometimes wonder if he wasn't faking it, you know, <laughs> just, just peeking around to see what kind of chaos and disaster is going to, Peter's over here, he's hyperventilating, you know. Judas doing God knows what he shouldn't be doing. Like, they're, like I just, I, but we'll take the text for what it says that Jesus is sleeping. And so naturally they go over and wake him up and say, Don't you care that we're going to drown? This storm has caused a storm of emotion that is causing a storm of theology. And so they go wake him up. They bring his attention to the storm. Because they need somebody to deal with the storm who's capable of dealing with this storm. They are not capable of doing it. Apparently nobody else in the boat is capable of doing it. And so they go to the authority that is capable of dealing with the storm. And I think in our lives when we, get, when we find ourselves in the middle of storms, it's kind of human nature to go to people who might be able to solve it for us. Maybe it's somebody with money who can throw something at it. Maybe it's somebody with an expertise in that area. Maybe it's somebody with medical expertise over the health storm I'm about to go through. Like We tend to bring people's attention to our storm if we think they're able to help. It's oftentimes the last resort that we wake Jesus up or bring his attention to our storm. You, you, you say, well, why do I need to do that? Why do I need to bring his attention to my storm? He ought to know about my storm. You're right. He does know about your storm. He knew about Abraham's storm when he was about to sacrifice Isaac. He knew about Joseph's storm when he found himself in prison. He knew about Moses' storm and the grumbling of a nation. He knew about Job's storm when life was falling apart. He knew about David's storm when Saul was trying to kill him. In all these storms, he already knew it. So why do I need to bring his attention to it? Maybe he wants to see how you'll respond. Or maybe he wants you to see how you'll respond. Maybe he wants you to see how you'll respond. He got up. He rebuked the wind and said to the waves, Quiet, be still. Then the wind died down, and it was completely calm. He said to his disciples, Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? On July 16th, 1999... John F. Kennedy Jr.'s single-engine plane crashed into the Atlantic Ocean off the coast of Martha's Vineyard, killing himself, his wife, and his sister-in-law, all in their early 30s. All investigations into the crash pointed to a phenomenon called spatial disorientation. Spatial disorientation is the term that's given to the condition a pilot experiences when flying through a storm that is so dense he can't see the horizon or the ground and he becomes disoriented. His points of reference that normally guide his senses disappear and his sensory perceptions become unreliable. He can no longer tell where he is or in which direction he is heading. And that's why most planes are equipped with navigational equipment. So that in storms like those, you can look at the instruments that will inform you of the plane's altitude, of ground speed, and if a pilot enters into dark or cloudy conditions where his natural orientations become unreliable, he can fly by the instruments. He can look at those instruments and know, that's true, 
My emotions, my feelings, my sense of reality is not true. These instruments are true. And so learning to place your confidence in your instruments over your senses is something that requires training. That doesn't happen naturally because you're naturally trained to trust what you feel and what you think. When our minds sense potential dangers, especially mortal danger, it's very difficult to trust instruments. As one expert stated, reflecting on the Kennedy crash, you have to be well trained to disregard what your brain is saying and fly by the instruments. Well, Kennedy had not received this training. He had been trained to fly planes in conditions where he could visually distinguish the ground from the sky, but en route to Martha's Vineyard, he flew into a hazy fog, experienced spatial disorientation, and he trusted his own perceptions to guide him straight into the Atlantic where they would find his plane and three bodies days later. See, I have a choice in this storm. I can trust my doubt-filled perceptions of what reality is, or I can trust the training that I've had in my life, the faith training that I've had in my life. I can trust that instrument, or I can trust how I feel. And we talked last week about that shaky foundation of feelings, didn't we? If only John F. Kennedy had had, Jr. had had that training he might have known better than to trust his sense of reality over actual reality. When your perceptions tell you something different than God's promises, always, always, always trust God's promises over your own perceptions. Why is it that we let our feelings and our emotions get the best of us in so many situations? 2 Corinthians 5 reminds us right here in verse 7 that we live by faith, not by sight. He begins by saying, therefore, we are always confident and we know that as long as we're at home in the body, we're away from the Lord. And so we live by faith, not by sight. We are confident, I say, and would prefer to be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So we make it our goal to please Him. Whether we are at home in the body or away from it, we make it our goal to please Him, which reminds me of Hebrews 11.6 that says, without what it is impossible to please God? Without Faith. Without the instrument of faith, it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to Him must believe that He is and that He rewards those who earnestly seek Him. We make it our goal to please Him through faith. The same faith that we are hopefully training ourselves in. Now, it's easy to assume that when I encounter a storm, I'm going to fall back on my training. But you know that not to be the case. You know that when you find yourself in the midst of that hysteria, of that tragedy, of that crisis, your emotions start to take over and your mind takes you to worst case scenarios. And falling back on faith isn't quite as easy as it sounds on a Sunday morning when you're sitting in church. That storm is emotional and it's disorienting. And for the apostles, the focus becomes the problem rather than the promises that God has given to them, rather than the promises that the Son of God, who's in the boat with them, has promised. Their focus is now the problem instead of the promise. And far too often, I think that happens as well in our own lives. Storms are always meant to deepen your faith and to give you a better understanding of who you're dealing with. They're unavoidable because you can't control when they come or how they come or how long they stay. Jesse Pointer came forward last week just to ask prayers again for Mary, who for a long time now has been experiencing her own storm. I had a woman call me last week whose marriage is just falling apart. I know her on a, fairly, uh, on a pretty surfacey level. Uh, I coached her son's soccer team four seasons ago. We don't see these people very often. 
And so I, 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 when she texted me and said, hey, can I call you? I sent that to Ange and said, what's this about? Ange said, I don't know. So I, said, I, so I told her, go ahead and call me. So she called me on Monday around 2 and said, and, and I said hello, and she said hello. And, and she just fell apart. She and her husband have seen multiple counselors to no avail, and it seems a separation is imminent. And unfortunately for her, there's not much of a foundation on Christ. We talked last week about you, you, you can't build a foundation in the middle of a storm. That's the one time you can't build a foundation. You're not laying concrete in the rain. You can build it before the storm. You can build one after the storm, but not in the middle of it. And see, now she finds herself in the middle of one without much of a foundation. And so in the short term, her future looks bleak. But what if... What if this storm, dreadful as it might be, is meant to shake her into faith? Jesus challenges the apostles on the basis of their faith. And when Jesus asks them, why are you so afraid? Do you no longer have faith? They are terrified and ask each other, who is this that even the wind and the waves obey Him. I don't know if you got that, 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 that when they saw the storm, they were afraid. When they realized who they were dealing with, they were terrified. When you understand who you're dealing with, your fears are likely put into better perspective. Trials are a journey of discovery of who you're dealing with. God wants you to know who you're dealing with, to understand Him better. Over two centuries ago, a poet named William Cooper was enduring a very difficult life. He lived a life beset by storm and tragedy. His mother died when he was six, and he had no relationship with his father. He struggled with mental illness and depression for many, many years. Finally, one bleak morning, he tried to put an end to it all by taking poison. And the attempt at suicide failed. A few weeks later, he drove down to the Thames River, intending to throw himself from the bridge, but was, quote, strangely restrained, unquote. He would try to kill himself two more times, the last one by hanging, but was found and t taken down unconscious, but still alive. And some time later, at the prodding of friends, he picked up a Bible and began reading. And Romans 6, in particular, had a profound influence on his life and was baptized and turned to Christ. The God of the storms had pursued him until the end and won his heart. And after a rich life of Christian experiences, Cooper sat down and looking back on his life, he wrote and recorded a hymn. It's number 26 in your songbooks, and it's called God Moves in a Mysterious Way. And you may not know it very well. I don't know it very well, but we're going to sing it anyways this morning. <laughs> and I'd like you to pay attention to the words as we do. God moves in a mysterious way His wonders to perform He plants His footsteps in the sea And rides upon the storm Deep in unfathomable minds of never-failing skill. He treasures up His bright designs and works His gracious will. Ye fearful saints, fresh courage take, the clouds ye so much dread are big with mercy and shall break 
in blessings on your head. His purposes will ripen fast, unfolding every hour. The bud may have a bitter taste, but sweet will be the flower. Blind unbelief is sure to and scan his work in vain. God is his own interpreter, and he will make it plain. And what of Jesus' storms? We've not said much about those. But the storms that Jesus would endure between Gethsemane and the cross were likely far worse than anything you or I will ever know. And He entered them willingly for us so that we could be rescued from all our storms, particularly the storm of God's wrath against our sin. That's why He came. His storm crushed Him so that our storms would become redemptive for us. And Hebrews 4 reminds us, Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who was unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet He did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. I'd like to finish where we began in verse 35. That day when evening came, he said to his disciples, let us go to the other side. We need to get from here to there. In my life, I need to get from here to there as a man. I need to get from here to there as a father. And from here to there as a husband and as a Christ follower, I am moving from here to there. Each of us is going to the other side. We are moving from one place to the other in so many ways. One of my favorite stories, one that I heard as a boy and I've told over and over and over, is of James Dobson's final words to his son. And you say, well, wait a minute, James Dobson's still alive. He is still alive. But after the death of Pete Maravich years ago, he sat his son down and said, in case you can't be by my side when I die, I want to give you my final words now. Those two words, he said, are these. Be there. Be there. On the other side. There is no guarantee that getting from here to the other side is going to be smooth sailing. Amen. Getting from who you are to who God wants you to be can be dangerous and is going to be stormy. But what happens to me does not have to happen in me. And it occurs to me that through all my storms, I'm still standing here. And through all of yours, here you are. He's brought you through it. And if He doesn't, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord anyways. So as that worship song goes, let go my soul and trust in Him. The waves and wind still know His name. The waves and wind of the earth still know His name. 
the waves and wind of whatever storm you're facing, they still know His name. And He is far more capable of taking care of it than any authority we could aspire to find. If you're in the boat with Jesus in the storm, there is no better place you could be. No better place. And I don't know your storm. I only know the ones that I've been in and how desperate I was in so many situations, relying on the faith of other people, unable to trust the instruments that I had always been trained in. And hopefully with each passing storm, that trust grows. But it's hard. 